everybody, welcome to the morning market briefing. It is uh, Monday, April 11th, 2022. Hope you're doing well out there. Hope uh, you can put up with a little noise. It's kind of loud here, got the cleaning crews, but hope you had a good weekend, all that good stuff. Uh, before we get rolling in earnest, a quick programming note, we will not have uh, a call tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning is uh, the one day a quarter that we take off specifically so that we can focus on our macro presentation. Our macro presentation will be available on Zoom as well as in person uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, if you have questions, need a link, any of that stuff, just let us know. We can get that over to you. Um, but no call tomorrow morning. Uh, also, no call Friday. It's a market holiday, so we will be uh, off and not providing coverage of a non-event day. So uh, with that out of the way, let's jump in and talk a little bit. Ben, we're going to open up with uh, the French elections, where things stand. Uh, and curious your take on this. I mean, you're kind of our chief. Uh, European correspondent on these types of things. Uh, how, how are things shaking out and what's the implication do you think more globally? Yeah, I always think back to the election with I think between Sarkozy and Hollande and that happened probably in 2012 maybe it was 2014 or something like that. Um, and I remember that very vividly because Hollande was not expected to beat Sarkozy. Sarkozy was the incumbent uh, and he reminds me a lot of Macron in terms of kind of the similar mannerisms, kind of chest pounding, that sort of thing, expected to win the incumbent. Uh, so the French can do this periodically. They can they can change colors fairly quickly. Um, having said that, I don't expect that to happen based on the results that we had the last weekend. So they have their initial election and the top two go to a runoff. And that's what we had over the weekend. Um, so the runoff will be held on February 24th. And if you recall last week, what we were talking about was the polls had Macron leading by 10, 11, 12 points about three weeks ago. But that gap narrowed dramatically over the last three weeks and was only three and a half points going into the election was the most recent poll. Macron ended up leading that 28 percent to 24 percent. So a, still a narrow victory for him. Um, but it didn't show any more degradation. Sometimes you see polls operate on a lag. And if you see Le Pen having momentum, she could have actually outperformed. But uh, it was slight underperformance from, uh, from Le Pen, slight outperformance from Macron. Le Pen is an interesting one. She has run many times uh, as the far right candidate. But again, as we talked about last time, the far right in France is a lot different than the far right here. Uh, so she's still a lot for workers' rights and that sort of thing as well. So uh, more populist, I would say. Uh, is Le Pen than uh, necessarily far right as we might think about it. Um, so that is going to go to a runoff that's going to be held on February 24th. The most recent poll on a head to head uh, matchup has Macron leading 55 to 45 percent. But who knows what what actually will uh, shake down. We still have another two weeks before the election. Uh, Le Pen does not have a history of winning these. But again, we've seen this in the past in France, and I would not be shocked to see it again, although it might have a negative impact on the Euro and European markets. Good deal. Thanks, Ben. Uh, bringing it more domestically, Elon Musk uh, has declined an opportunity to serve on Twitter's board. This has been a story for the last couple of weeks uh, in different ways. First, him amassing a massive amount of shares. Secondly, uh, the proposal from Twitter to him to join the board, they said he had to pass a background check, which I found kind of funny, uh, as if there would be something that you know, people didn't really quite know who this Elon Musk character was, uh, but he's decided to pass. Twitter stocks are down, is down four or five percent, something like that on that. Ben, what's his angle uh, and why would he potentially want to really maneuver the system so that he didn't have to be a board member? Yeah, maybe he just likes the headlines. Um, he had one tweet following his non-appointment to the board with his hand over. It's his, it was a smiley face emoji with his hand over the mouth. And then he deleted the tweet a few hours later. So I think that's Elon Musk just kind of trolling. He likes to do these tweets that don't really mean anything. And then people read into them. Uh, I think the real reasons is that he didn't want the obligation. He didn't want to have a fiduciary duty to the Twitter shareholders. Um, and he didn't. And he might, if things really go sour, he might want to acquire a stake more than 15%. And you're not allowed to do that if you're a board member. So I think he wants the options. And I also think he doesn't want the responsibility of being a board member where you have to have a fiduciary duty to Twitter shareholders. So uh, 
I think that's probably the reason. But I think at the end of the day, he just doesn't want another thing on his plate. Yeah, I thought, I mean, it's kind of the perfect recipe for him. Less responsibility, every bit of the news cycle attention that he wants, and he can still have a decent amount of control just by being a major shareholder. I thought the Twitter release was kind of interesting where they talked about how, hey, we offered him a seat, which we thought was a really great idea. He turned it down, and we thought that was a great idea, too. Uh, They're certainly trying to PR this thing to make it look uh, as much like a non-event as possible, but uh, kind of interesting to see that stock really bounce up on uh, potential of him joining the board and really fall with him not joining the board. Uh, You know, just it's another incident, it seems like, of uh, just must kind of manipulating stock prices here and there. So kind of something to I would expect to continue from this guy. I mean, he really likes the attention, as you touched on. Uh, Tom, government's calling off muni bond issuance, according to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Talk to us about what's going on there, uh, what you're expecting over the coming months, what we've already seen. Yeah, so we're down about 8% year over year in terms of first quarter new bond issuance. And there's a number of things driving it. The first, obviously, is interest rates. As interest rates rise, when municipalities have to issue new debt, they've got to issue that debt at the current interest rate environment, which is significantly elevated uh, from where it was last year. So I expect that part of the trend to continue. Uh, The second piece to that is that a lot of these places don't need to raise debt. You know, there's a lot of COVID relief money that's still in the coffers for a lot of states, uh, New Jersey, which we talked about on the call, being upgraded for the first time in the last, you know, 25 years uh, back out of triple B and into single A uh, is a big positive development. The reason for that is they've got more money. They got a lot of bailout money. They illegalized uh, online sports gambling, which has been a big profit center for the state of New Jersey, particularly since people were not allowed to do that in New York and were just driving across the border border to play sports bets. Uh, So instead of being a state that you know, was slowly issuing debt and having it mount and mount and mount and credit quality getting poorer, uh, they're actually in a position finally where they're getting on better footing. And instead of issuing new debt for projects, they actually have uh, a couple billion dollars on the books they can use for uh, capital expenditures without having to issue debt at all, uh, which is very positive. And I think that if you dovetail that in with the fact that bonds have sold off significantly, you've got kind of a perfect storm for what I would say is a great opportunity for buying muni bonds because one is they're cheaper, which is huge. And they're as cheap as they've been in the last five years. The second is the credit quality is better because all these states have uh, you know new cash flows either from the government or from you know refinancing their debt last year at very very low rates and locking in a low interest rate for a long time. I mean we got a notification this morning. We don't have a ton of debt from North Dakota, but the state of North Dakota was upgraded this morning. Uh, you know so it's a state nobody thinks about suddenly doing a lot better. Does it have to do with the fact they've got a lot of oil there? Probably, uh, but that's just more money for North Dakota. So those bonds are cleaner now. Uh, and the third is that there's less of them available. You know, muni bonds have traditionally been some of the most sought after securities because they are tax exempt. And, you know, there's a reason why, you know, Mitt Romney and Donald Trump and all these big politicians don't want to release their tax returns is because they own a lot of muni bonds, uh, like a lot of our clients do, and they avoid taxes by owning them. And so it's really a great opportunity. You know, our, our interest rate is going to continue to climb, probably so, especially if we get a number of rate hikes. But as long as we're holding maturity and we're looking for the right bonds, you know, we, we can get really good stuff for cheaper prices at better credit quality than we could really for the last couple of years. Because if you really wanted to get yield, you know, in the zero interest rate environment that we we're in over the last couple of years, you had to either go out uh, really long on the bonds and expose yourself to interest rate risk, or you had to go really long on the credit ladder and expose yourself to default risk. And so we're basically able to do uh, everything we want to do in bonds right now. And while they might erode a little bit more quickly in terms of the pricing, we're still going to net that uh, that income over time and, and grab that yield. And if the credit quality is good, then we don't really have to uh, be afraid that we're going to be in a default situation. And so, you know, it's really just the best of, of all worlds for munis right now. And so I think that the smart money, the big money, the people who see the writing on the wall, the tax rates are probably going to go up are probably buying a lot of muni bonds. Uh, and those who don't understand bond math or, or the esoteric pieces of the bond market are probably selling aggressively, which is why we're seeing so much secondary market supply uh, at such good prices. So uh, it's exciting news, I think, especially as we have bonds come due, we can lock in at stuff that's much higher and, and be in it for the long term. Uh, but for you know the short term, in terms of what it looks like for the existing bonds in the books, the pricing is, is eroding quite quickly. But uh, the good news is those bonds will eventually roll off, turn to cash, and we can and we can deploy them into this new uh, rate environment. 
Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Good news indeed. Uh, ben, incredibly busy week. Uh, we're getting economic data like CPI tomorrow, uh, small business optimism survey tomorrow. We're going to start really ramping up earnings. We've got an ECB meeting on Thursday. We'll get retail sales data on Thursday. Uh, as you're kind of looking at the week ahead, it's a bit daunting in terms of the amount of data that's coming through. How would you kind of prioritize uh, what people need to be really paying attention to and what themes are you looking for? I think it's going to be the big economic data. I think that, I mean, let's bucket it. So first of all, tomorrow morning, we have the CPI data for the month of March. Again, that's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see where the auto uh, inflation ended up landing. So this is going to be a big inflation data that everyone's going to be talking about. The headline expectation is up 8.4% on a year over year basis on a month over month basis, if you especially if you strip out food and energy, we're actually only expected to be up half a percent. So a lot of that is due to base effects from the prior year. Um, we're going to get into a lot of this on at tomorrow's macro uh, presentation. So I, I don't want to spoil it all right now, but I think this is a key contributor to declining CEO confidence. And we're going to be talking a lot about that tomorrow, but we're, we're definitely starting to see some impacts of inflation on confidence and expectations for hiring and capital expenditures and that sort of thing. So we need that inflation to start uh, tapering down. Um, we also get data on retail sales that'll come out on Thursday. The headline is actually to show a little bit of an acceleration, but if you strip out gasoline prices, it's still going to be flat on a month over month basis, which would not be so good. Again, you have a later Easter this year, which could delay some retail sales and, and provides in a little bit of an excuse for having a weaker March than normal. Nevertheless, I think that a lot of people will be watching retail sales closely in that headline number. Uh, we're seeing a big dichotomy right now in terms of what's going on in the freight markets and what companies like Costco have said about the last five weeks. And we need some more data to actually understand what's going on there. And then you layer on top of that, you have JP Morgan, which is reporting on Wednesday morning. I don't expect them to talk very bullishly. Uh, Jamie Dimon was already out with a letter last week saying that expect volatility. And then you also have Delta Airlines reporting tomorrow morning, uh, excuse me, Wednesday morning. And that'll be really interesting to see what is the state of airline demand. I know that there was a big push for air travel about a month ago, but now that prices have gone up, I'm wondering if that's beginning to price some customers out of the market. And then finally, we have the big ECB meeting on Thursday morning. And I'm really watching that one closely because you're seeing a massive divergence in terms of the priorities of a lot of Europeans. You got the Italians who really want growth and you have the Germans who are petrified of inflation, justifiably so, because we know what happened last time that happened in Germany with the Weimar Republic in the 1930s and how that all ended. And uh, on top of that, Christine Lagarde has COVID. So, um, and she's the president of the ECB. So you have a lot of cross currents happening right now and there's gonna be a lot to manage. Uh, keep in mind that the ECB's policy rate is still negative 0.5%. So you need two rate hikes just to get back to even. For context, by the May 4th meeting, the Federal Reserve will probably have the rates at 0.75% positive. And so we're not even talking about a rate hike at the ECB level until December. And I think that that will probably be on track. But nevertheless, I do think that the ECB has a lot of work cut out for it. They're having the same inflation problems as we're having, except they're actually having even worse growth than us. So that's going to be something I'm really looking forward to um, having some resolution on, at least on an interim basis. But again, we're going to talk a lot about this all tomorrow. Uh, in a lot more cogent, more logical, thought out form. Uh, so I encourage you to join us for that. Um, until then, uh, we're just going to be digesting this data and we'll have, we'll be back here on Wednesday morning. Yeah, and hope you can join us uh, in some form or fashion tomorrow. If you cannot, we should have a recording or at least the slides up on the blog. We can get that out to you guys and uh, we will keep things moving. We'll talk to you guys soon and uh, look forward to the macro tomorrow. No call in the morning. Back on the call Wednesday.